Hi, everybody. Welcome back from break. I know it, it's hard on the second day of the conference to pull yourself away from those critical conversations. But this is going to be, I think, a really good one. We are. Um, I've been sitting and listening this morning, and one thing I, I heard from a few people next to me was, was on some of the panels, not all, was sort of, oh, this is very US focused. And we are pulling you out now of the US and uh, really talking about global energy perspectives with two people who are doing work in critical countries, China and India, but also all over the world. Um, and, and really going from the macro to putting these technologies in the ground, to putting these technologies in the, um, into the market. So I'm very, very excited about the panel. Uh, thank you both for being here. So to my right, I have Zhang Lei, who is the CEO of Envision Energy. And Envision Energy, he describes to me as an energy technology company. So doing renewables at a very large scale, but also very focused on the Internet of Things, on IoT. And he'll, they're headquartered in Shanghai, and he will be talking about work they do all over the world, um, not just in China. And then next to him, Abhijit Sate, who's the COO of SoftBank Energy. Um, and SoftBank Energy is the global uh, part of the SoftBank Energy world, uh, headquartered in Delhi and doing large-scale renewable generation as well as EV penetration, again, all over the world, mostly in Asia, I think. Um, and expanding more. And expanding more, and with a fair amount of US technology partnership That's as correct. well. So we have a great um, kind of perspective here going from these big questions we've been talking about for two days on global climate change, global energy, global grid requirements down really into what does this end up looking at the local level and how do you get it done? Um, so I'm going to ask both of you, and, and Leigh, I'll start with you. You know, you've been doing this work for a while. What do, this, this panel is about global energy transformation. What do you see in your work out there that you really think is transforming global energy systems? You know, with, with what Arun's talked about in mind, what others have talked about, where do you see transformation happening? So <clears throat> we spend recently a lot of time on the energy IoT systems. And uh, the reason, actually s since 2012, the reason why we focus that much on the energy IoT is you know, because we early days, we starting with uh, wind turbines. We are so convinced, so renewable energy is going to be dominating. So it's going to be, give us the almost close to zero cost of energy eventually. So we start to be worried. So what's the future of energy company if you actually have the almost zero cost of energy? So mm -hmm. that's true. It's already happening. Now you see the utility scale solar is close to three cents. And if we're doing the renewable energy, wind energy in Inner Mongolia, so we see the cost of energy is reaching around 1.5 cents per kilowatt hour. Right. So it's, it's, it's just only like, a, renewable energy is basically like a teenager. It's starting like 2000. Right. Yeah, so a teenager is already being so dominating, invasive. So I started to worry. So when, what will be most, most expensive things in such a free energy system? Yep. So then I realized, okay, you could have a zero cost of energy, but you are going to have a huge cost of synergy. Mm. The synergy, actually, some of our utility friend just mentioned. So you see the gas pump, they have a big challenge to run little time, and the, the grid utility is worried about stability. So you know, when the, this renewable energy kick in, so our energy system has become very fragmented. So more or less, if you reach 50 or 80% renewable energy, so this is going to be dominant, not about renewable energy, it's about the weather, weather system. And hmm. by billions of solar panels, charge point, and wind turbines, and EVs. So this is such a chaotic system. So how can you organize such a chaotic system? So there's synergy. How do you synchronize your supply, your demand with the supply is a key. That's why I say, okay, we are shifting from cost of energy to cost of synergy. 
It's a really interesting point. We talk a lot about the shift to renewables being one where we shift from paying for energy over a long time to paying for capital costs and then free energy. But you're really making this additional point of, yes, and then when the energy is essentially free, there's all of this integration that then becomes a new challenge with new actors and new companies and new innovations. That's really a great point. Abhijit, what do you think the, where do you think the big transformations are happening? So I think, you know, having worked uh, in other parts of the world, the developed parts of the world, um, now I'm working in uh, parts of the world, and speaking of teenagers, uh, where the population of youth <laughs> is at the highest, India, Africa, and a few other countries. Um, and these are also underdeveloped economies, so they're growing at some of the highest rates today, seven to eight. 9%. And so what you're seeing is, uh, you know, the previous infrastructure obviously can't keep up with the youth and the in, uh, increasing demand for energy coming from the growth. Um, and so like a revolution that probably took place 20 years ago in these parts of the world on telecom, where instead of laying copper wires and having telephone network like we have here, uh, I think these countries are basically hopping uh, that entirely and going instead of investing into the traditional type of resources, which obviously you know, some countries now are against nuclear, others uh, may not want coal, uh, some others just care about low cost. But what's happening is there is a massive revolution going on in these countries. Uh, the demand we're talking about, so you know, I've worked, for example, in the US for about 10 years. Um, you know, I've, we've built largest plants so many times. You know, Generally, the plants were like 5, 10, 20, 50, 100, 120 megawatts. Uh, now, you know, the territories that we are operating in, typical plant size is probably a few hundred megawatts at the lowest because the demand is such, because the uh, projected growth and the youth uh, demanding, uh, you know, electricity and so on, the lifestyle is such. So that's one aspect you see is, uh, you know, underdeveloped economies growing, substantial percentage of people under 25 in that part of the world. Uh, the second thing is, you know, um, any of us can open up and look at uh, Delhi, where uh, my office currently is, and uh, look at what the Apple uh, uh, thing says right under Delhi. Probably says hazardous air quality. This is all too common in the area. So for example, uh, I was once observing the three cities that I shuttled between um, were pretty much uh, three in top five worst air quality, right? So um, whether there is the awareness that is existing in the world and where there would be value put on carbon, which I don't think it is, you know, cost dominates, uh, which is actually the third dynamic that, that goes on. Um, you know, I think people are realizing that, you know, they are, whether they speak about it and put a value on it and give, you know, money for carbon or not, Pollution is definitely a, a, a part that is uh, playing on people's mind in these parts of the world. Uh, and the third one is cost. Uh, these happen to be territories where uh, even three cents is too expensive. Yep. Right? So, uh, and there is probably not enough money for you know, carbon credits and things like that. So uh, that naturally uh, creates the necessity to drive the cost down. And you know, a lot of times people approach cost down as let's cut things out, but that's really not, not the way to look at it. It's about innovating and innovating faster. And so what you see is uh, incredible uh, innovation, and even that innovation, the way you target it, is very different. For example, um, you know, a lot of innovation uh, can be targeted at reducing labor costs, because labor costs in other parts of the world are significantly higher, just to give you a sense. Uh, Indian labor cost compared to US labor cost for a solar project is somewhere between five and 10x less. Hmm. So why would I put a little bit more capex and take out labor? I might do other things, you know, so the innovation gets targeted very differently. Um, and then, you know, uh, the fourth dynamic that we're seeing uh, in terms of trends and revolution going on is, is what Lay talked about. Um, you know, just like the uh, telephone paradigm, the previous infrastructure wasn't there. So when you start talking about grids, super grids, and uh, connectivity, and using these things uh, as efficiently as you can so that, you know, you don't go get into, uh, at least today, uh, uh, storage that's far too expensive to solve some of these problems. Renewable and storage have to be paired. We all, gen generally speaking, can uh, get behind that. Uh, but the cost of storage is too high right now. So these uh, uh, countries and territories that are actually going mass scale uh, renewables, and what is impressive to say, for example, is 
California obviously sitting at about 30, 35% renewables, uh, and on given days it's for, uh, you know even 50%. Um, but even in countries like India, you know the, that percentage at a country level is now exceeding 20%. So when you start talking about that and you say, all right, you know what, it's all intermittent generation, how are you going to fight intermittency and what are you going to do at night? Uh, there, you know, things about storage and uh, using uh, all the renewable resources effectively and bringing down the uh, uh, need for a very expensive storage, those types of things also start going into innovation. So those are sort of broadly the four themes along which we're seeing, uh, you know, global innovation going and going a little bit differently compared to the Western part of the world. There's a lot of a lot of food for thought there, but when, what you were talking about was making me think just about something we've talked a lot preparing for this panel, which is just the profoundly local nature of how these things play out in the different countries where you're working. And, and Leigh, can you talk a little bit, and then Abhijit, a little bit about sort of how the kind of existing, the, the, the population, the, the, the energy mix, the existing economies of the places that you're working how does that affect what you can and can't do? So you're going into a place with a renewables project, and uh, and the default question in most of the much of the rest of the world, though not as much here anymore, is is coal, right? Um, as, as a cheap energy source, and you're kind of coming in saying we have another way. How do you make that argument? Can you give some examples of places you've done that, or or how you think that plays out? So, you know, so I think long term planning is very critical. So that's why I mentioned it. So when even in the high days of the, the early days of renewable energy, we started planning the energy IoT system. So for any country or any company, you should really thinking much long ahead. So to avoid you are being trapped in such difficult situation. So that planning is the most critical thing. Well, and just to push on that a little bit, how do you how do you make a case for, and Abhijit, you can jump in on this too, how do you make a case for long-term planning in a place with short-term political cycles and, frankly, in a situation where you're replacing, in some cases, a very labor-intensive industry that's mining-dependent, transportation-dependent, you know, continual extraction-dependent, with something that has a fair amount of labor at the beginning but may not have as much going forward? How do you make that long-term argument in that political context? It's very difficult. A great point, by the way. Um, you know, so for example, we deal with the Indian government at hundreds of gigawatt type of scale, uh, but there is a political cycle in India that's about five, every five years. And right now, the next set of elections is, you know, in, in uh, next May. And as as it happens here, uh, the existing government doesn't want to take any risks and sign long-term contracts. So yes, it is hampered uh, tremendously. So I think you know you have to live with that reality a little bit. And you know, obviously, we will have to be very smart about when the elections are over to hit hit people up about you know policy more then than you know year three or year four of their uh, term. Um, but you know, I think, for example, Indian uh, electricity base load comes from coal. Right, uh, they have lots of installed gas capacity, but they don't have gas, so much of the capacity is actually shuttered. Right, so uh, and then the Indian coal, uh, you know, as as a raw material going into uh, these plants, uh, has a lot of lignite and is doesn't have a, as high a cal calorific value. So uh, these are actually local realities, but despite of that. Uh, since it is base load, since we are intermittent generation, I think the only way we've learned to fight uh, when you get into these conversations with the government, like the Department of Power and things like that, is basically to be better on merit without subsidy. Mm -hmm. There is no subsidy, and, and the easiest way to fight this is that. And this is where uh, the previous point I made, which is incredible cost pressure. Uh, and of course, you know we're building 25-year assets. We all want to do, do a good job about building and living up to that uh, headline, uh, then it all comes to innovation, technology innovation. That, that's a great point. And, and Leon, uh, from your perspective, back to your long-term point, do you find, I mean, you, you do a fair amount of work in China and other places. In China, do you find the five-year planning process to be helpful in terms of long-term planning and making those arguments? Is that a helpful overlay to the politics of kind of doing this work in China? Or is it sort of still basically back to Abhijit's point, you just have to compete on the cost? Yeah, I think um, you know, China also have this kind of five years planning, yeah. and uh, I'm not sure whether it's helpful or not. But uh, at least you know you should have uh, you know, really have the long term thinking. Right. So, 
So for, from an envision point of view is, so now what we are thinking today is not even beyond energy IoT. We are thinking beyond energy. So in the future, where the, when in a renewable energy society, what is the most valuable things? Because cost of energy is zero, or very close to zero maybe. But uh, so what is most needed for the society? Probably is not energy. But energy becomes the real commodity. How do you convey this service based on energy? So something we recently we have seen, we're providing the IoT operating system for Singapore smart nation. So we are thinking beyond energy because we say, okay, now our energy IoT system is connecting hundred millions of devices. The first step is we are helping the energy efficiency, produce more energy or saving more energy. And the second step, because this energy IoT is the gateway to the machine network. You now you're able to control the machine. You can do the all the kind of machine efficiency, make a machine more reliable, more predictive maintenance. Yeah. Then, after that, you can even achieve this operation efficiency. So then, how can you create energy, or not energy, is a machine social network. Create a machine networking platform, so to achieve this operation efficiency. So, you know, this kind of things, so as a, you know, the leader of energy industry, we should see is, should really go beyond today's situation. It's not back, backward looking. And uh, you, know, you see, uh, someone said, okay, so the utility industry is still quite, you know, is, is a robust model. I don't think so. Mm. It's a, on the biggest challenge. You know, oil and gas companies think about hydrogen, ammonia, think about fuel cell, and EV companies coming, they want to be a, New, new type of energy service provide like Tesla, like, like Nissan. So, you know, and the community solar, community wing is find another angle, and the digital company also want to play inside. So, you know, so that's the, the, lots of fusion coming. So what we see in the energy company is you cannot be a pure energy company anymore. Or more companies will become energy companies that weren't prior utilities, right? So we just heard GM is becoming an energy company yeah, so, to some extent. So utilities Total become volatility. Becoming an energy, right? Becoming an electricity company. Yeah. Mm. There's a question uh, from, from the audience that I think is related to this and, and related to what you both said about both competing on cost and some of the innovations you're talking about, which is, and, and to your point, Abhijit, about India not having the gas resources, which is, do you think some of these developing countries will, will leapfrog over gas? will essentially go from coal to renewables without this quote unquote bridge fuel that we have here that's been such a huge part of the revolution here. Abhi, do you wanna go to that? A very interesting question. So I think there is no one size fit all. So just give a couple of examples, right? So uh, one of the territories we are working in is in Saudi Arabia. So guess what? There is no coal and there is a lot of gas. And you try to tell them alternatives to gas, it doesn't work very well. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, you know, you go to coal country and you say the opposite, you know, you're probably not easily gonna replace coal. So in, in, in areas like this, we're, we're being given a challenge to say, uh, my, my base load is coal, can you beat my variable cost only? So it becomes, it becomes a, and by the way, you know, uh, you know there's a lot, lot of talk about innovation and things like that. On the consumer, on the selling side, you're selling an electron, it is a commodity. People can't differentiate. You know, in the Western world, people would value if it's coming from a clean resource. In other countries, you don't even have the choice to select where your energy is coming from. So eventually it will get there. It is not there today. Uh, but you know, in terms of will gas replace coal, I think it's a very, very localized answer depending on the resources available. I do think uh, that uh, in countries where uh, gas dominates, it will be, such as KSA, uh, Saudi Arabia, it will be very difficult, but eventually one would. Um, and you know, in, in areas where coal is easily available, you know, I think uh, People have realized, you know, especially in some parts of the world, uh, I think it'll still be a tough conversation for us to come in and, uh, as in renewable industry, to come in and beat that. But I think we're just going to have to beat it, beat it head on and at a, at a cost that is lower than their variable cost. I had one comment yeah. on gas. Go ahead, please. Is, uh, because, you know, so one speaker mentioned about the gas provides capacity. Right. 
And uh, what I think is uh, no, not limited to the capacity. Capacity is not only about the physical capacity. Someone we should be able to provide in the digital capacity. That's why IoT is so important. This digital capacity is very similar to today's Uber or Lyft model. So in a very fragmented energy world, mm -hmm. how are you able to orchestrate these devices to create a digital capacity and to create these dynamic things for pricing? Well, and that's related to another question from the audience, but also I've been thinking as you've been talking, Leigh, in your vision, sorry, um, for, for, for the future, you know, what role do these big transformations that Arun talked about play, the battery, lithium ion batteries, and, um, and storage? Can you create the world you're talking about without a dependence on batteries? Uh, what does that look like? And I'm going to just add layers on this. And what role do EVs play in that? It's yeah. particularly in developing areas where EVs are a much bigger part of the market. Does that become a backup battery thing for you? Does that get integrated into your vision? How, how do you see all that playing out? It's a great question. Is, uh, you know, so I have something to add on Arun's comment. He, he mentioned that by 2022, so we are able to reach $100 per kilo hour. But uh, I say we're going to arrive much early. By 2020, we are able to deliver the cost of uh, about 100 US dollar. So because we are recently, we, we've just bought a Japanese uh, battery company. So we are very detailed and anal analyze these trends of cost. So we are able probably by 2025 to achieve 50 US dollar per kilo hour. You know what that means? That means by 2020, when you, because think about 10 years ago, you have 1,000 US dollar per kilo hour. 2020, you have 100 US dollar per kilo hour. Make your capex on the car is almost similar to the diesel, diesel car. By 2025, you only have another half. Your capex on the EV is going to be much cheaper, 20 or 30% cheaper than diesel car. So overnight, people is going to change because there's a consumer market. Yeah. And what I can tell you is in China, every new year, every year is about 30 million cars coming to the market. So if this changed overnight, 30 million cars, if you assume that every car has 50 kilowatt batteries, this capacity is going to 1,500 gigawatt, uh, gigawatt capacity. You know what that means for China? The historical accumulative generation capacity for China is 1,800 gigawatt. Hmm. So within a year, you have to double your capacity for the last 30 years or 40 years. That's a huge impact for the energy system. That's why I say EV is going to be have fundamental challenge on today's, today's energy system. How, how are you going to, if this car ch charging same time, right. or even say charging randomly, is big big headache for the utility, for grid. So that's why IoT and the plus AI, that's why I say yeah. AI, AIoT is very critical for the future, to help you to distributing this energy charging, discharging, balancing grid, and also taking into account of the weather pattern, and also about temperature things, then it's, very, it's kind of very sophisticated system. Right. You need AI to solve that. So, right. Right. So, so bringing on this huge amount of new demand, but you're thinking sort of how do you make that a, how do you have that become a, a, bon a benefit instead of a, a challenge? Yeah, for, true. For the, so you can market. turn yeah. challenge into the benefit. Right, right, right. So that's why, so if I say. you have the systems so, that integrate. Yeah, I yeah. add on the I, AIoT is going to the force biggest trend for the, for the energy industry. Because this is, act, renewable battery is acting on this uh, supply side or demand side. And the shale gas is supply or demand. But you should act on something on the system side. That's the yeah. digital IoT plus AI. Well, I want to get back to that. But um, Abhijit, I have a question specifically for you from the okay. audience. Um, which is, um, unless you want to weigh in on this question, in which case you can, but this- Yeah, question. just uh, a yeah. different aspect <laughs> of it. Um, I think, you know, every time we talk about energy storage, naturally batteries come to mind, but um, I think the, to answer the question, uh, 
you know, from a technology perspective. I think that's just going to be a smart, small part of the solution. I think there may be many different ways in which uh, you know, uh, energy can be stored or uh, redistributed as, as is necessary at times. Um, and I think the cost of batteries will ensure that batteries at the moment are not the only solution. So you might get all variety of solution demand response. You might get uh, uh, you know hybrid systems where you're combining few resources uh, such as wind and solar where they're complementary and then pumping it into uh, the grid that way. Uh, you know I, I think all the all of the above is going to happen. I think liquid air, compressed air, uh, flywheel, pumped hydro. I think they're gonna, all going to be part of the portfolio. Great. So sort of an everything and uh, answer. Yeah. Uh, you know, this is a question switching gears a little bit toward policy. This is a question that comes from several of you out there um, who have asked about sort of policy environments and, and the role of policy. And Amajit, I'm going to put this on you because you made the point that things had to compete without subsidy. Um, uh, how, how do I phrase this? So, so California has gotten where it is in large part because of the policy environment. It's a combination of policy innovation and market creation. They're all working sort of together mm -hmm. with a regulatory environment. How do you think about the role of policy in moving what you're talking about, moving renewables faster? Um, and then the particular question was, what do you think about India's potential to use the social cost of carbon? Is it starting to happen more and more? to incorporate some of those air quality impacts that you were talking about and the pollution impacts and actually just so sort of speed adoption, um, change the cost curve a bit. Yeah. So interestingly, you know, it's, it's a place where it should, but it doesn't. Uh, there is, you don't get any, uh, there used to be a rec system that is wrecked. There is, there is no uh, additional benefit you get. So, so the government, you know, when they uh, announced like 100 gigawatt by 2022 type of target, uh, they really, there's zero subsidy and there is zero value being put on, uh, you, know, uh, you know, reducing carbon emissions and things like that. Uh, so I think, you know, in, in these territories, and we're, we're seeing the same thing in uh, other geographies that we're expanding to, some in Middle East and some in Africa. Um, I think at the end of the day, uh, between there being political will, political consensus, uh, you know, even to put maybe extra cost on gross polluters, mm -hmm. it there may be laws and they just don't get followed. So for example, NOx and SOx emissions coming from other sources, there actually is a law and, and, and we have realized that people are not actually paying that penalty. So I, you know, uh, as an industry so, or as a or company, then you just go and decide, all right, I just have to take this head on and bring the cost where it, you basically just beat the alternate sources. And we are there now. I mean, we're, we're below uh, you know, where cost of generation is, where the issue right now is we're not a 24-7 supply. Coal can be or gas can be or nuclear can be. You know, it's interesting you talking about the um, the enforcement side, really. Um, I was talking to somebody recently about the Indian government structure and, and heard this may or may not be true, but I was struck by it, that the entire sort of EPA-like regulatory structure, the number of staff is less than in California. That's correct. Right, for the entire country, which is amazing um, if you think about the enforcement issues. And in China, actually, that was true till fairly recently as well. Very small enforcement arm for environmental uh, uh, regulation. What do you think, Lay, about this question of policy? What role do you see? And I want to ask you specifically, it's also related to a question from the audience. You've kind of talked about blowing up the utility model and all of these companies coming in and different pieces of this being owned by different people. What does the regulatory structure look like for that? If you were sort of to wave a wand and say, here's how I would design you know, the policy and regulatory environment for all of these actors coming into this new kind of grid of the future, what would that look like? Yes, no, it's, it's, uh, no we, we need imagination on that. And uh, you know, for me, um, I don't care too much about the policy because <laughs> policy is always slow. You realize I do policy yeah, for policy living, is so. always slow. <laughs> <laughs> I won't take that personally. <laughs> and uh, and uh, take too much about the select issues, balancing. Sometimes policies tend to be balancing. Mm -hmm. So I believe in this market force and technology. The reason, so that's why I'm so you know, keen on this EV revolution. Yeah. So it's kind of fundamental bottom-up change, totally. So then policy, what I can expand, they're going to still react, but they're going to react much faster. Today's policy is not proactive enough 
but they are going to force to react much faster. Well, EVs will force the mobility side to go faster, right? I mean, EVs will change, will force the, the, the transition from combustion vehicles, yeah. but in countries like China, EVs are still running mostly on coal. So what is it that forces the renewable side to go faster mm. while the EV side is going faster? So that's actually is about, you see that China have uh, every year is taking about 50% uh, of renewable installation for globally. And uh, still the coal is a uh, quite dominant factor. And uh, what we can say in China is uh, probably is um, we, again, this is kind of a revolution starting, should start from the edge. So should starting from this distributed solar. Mm -hmm. For instance, previously no policy on distributed solar. So <laughs> overnight in 2016, so distributed solar, or 2017, last year, it suddenly have 30 gigawatt installation. And then policymakers realize this is going to big trouble on the energy system. They start to make policy to actually to curtail this distributed solar. Right. So what I want to say is, so, you know, so you always have to find a way starting from the edge, yeah. starting from this, uh, the, the grassroots, start from the different cross function, cross industry revolution. Right. That's why EV, you know, so, you know, is, uh, is about, is, uh, again, for coal, coal issue, I think, you know, so once we make renewable energy, it's so cost competitive. Right. Now government realize, okay, now renewable energy, you don't need a subsidize. You, you and, and the grid company also welcomes to that because it gives them great incentive to build high voltage transmission line as well. So you are able to ship two cents uh, renewable energy from Inner Mongolia to Shanghai. Right. So that's actually everyone benefit. Right. Well, I feel, and I feel the need to um, defend my, my poor policy world here for just a second by saying <laughs> the reason I would argue that solar's gotten as cheap as it is is in large part because of the German feed-in tariff and Chinese manufacturing policy, both of which were policies, so as well as U.S. renewable energy standards and other things. So we may be able to leave it behind now, but it helped us get where we are. So let's have a little moment of, of thanks uh, <laughs> for the policy world. Uh, Abhijit, I, you know, given your kind of, you guys are building very big and you're, you're um, building in a lot of places. Where Can you talk about, but India and also some of the other places you're working, where do you see the biggest bottlenecks to renewable scale? Um, I think, you know, and uh, I would list in order of priority. Unfortunately, I make too many slide decks. Uh, policy, land, and grid in that order. <laughs> uh, policy my, is a huge baby. problem uh, <laughs> in terms of... Uh, you know, the PPA is essentially part of whatever the government wants to offer uh, a lot of times because utilities are controlled by governments in most of these countries. So that is a huge bottleneck right now for us. Uh, uh, acquiring land in highly populous countries, you know, yeah. makes a lot of sense. And then infrastructure, uh, you know, we all are familiar with curtailments happening in a variety of countries, uh, you know. And I think the non-enforcement issue yeah. is very different from the Western world. You know, I was in a conference on storage about three months ago in California, and it was heartening for me to talk about people honoring contracts and things like that. A lot of times, you know, contracts don't even have the value of the paper they're written on in some of these other countries. So right. those are real problems of doing business in, in these countries. So uh, rule of law as well as enforcement, right? I mean, there's a Land, whole, for example, yeah. I have a live project and there's a hut in the middle of, you know, a critical plot where I just suddenly can't build for six months. It's not even belonging to the person who chose to build a hut. Wow. In fact, my team sometimes jokes with me, Abhijit, we should get in the build, uh, business of building these huts in the middle of solar power plants. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we have such good questions. I'm, I'm trying to integrate them as much as I can, um, but you also are, are, are sparking more. Um, just before I go to my next one, Leigh, do you have any kind of big challenges that you're seeing, any, any specific examples of where you're seeing challenges to scale? Any of the places you're working? I mean, you do a lot of work in, I know, Denmark and, and Europe, and sort of where do you see some of the big challenges? On the current uh, uh, energy world? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see. To scaling up renewables and to your sort of vision of the sort of integrated renewable economy, let's put it that way. Yeah, I think, you know, so at least I can comment something is, uh, is on the U.S. 
yeah. is also uh, also on the European utilities. I found that European utilities are quite different to the U.S. utilities. Mm. So we work a lot with uh, Danish grid companies, Norwegian grid companies, also German DSO, TSO, and also utilities. I found the uh, U.S. side is uh, utilities is, uh, is quite is relatively slow on this. Uh, Adaptive to these renewable energies, so and uh, and uh, I trying to figure out what's what actually behind that is. Um, so no, I still I'm still uh, and also on China side is uh, China utility is uh, basically controlled by the great companies, yeah. yeah, and the generation and uh, so lots of the big utility generation companies they. They now as they're shifting a lot on the renewable productions. But uh, the good thing is, uh, now, so renewable energy got its cost advantage. So now, now they're mainly producing the renewable energy. So, but it's also, you know, all the utility around the world is a, it's quite actually slow move. So that's actually, I have a big expectation on the EV. So because right. consumer now is the first time Consumer billions driven. consumers, yeah. so they are going to overnight to challenge this energy system. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and they, everyone also has a chance to change the color of electricity. Because in the past, consumer say, okay, there's gasoline in my tank. We, it's just one way. So now you have become two right. ways right. of your energy, and also you are able to choose what's the color of the energy in my battery side. Right. So then this is going to create lots of new business model, create lots of new dynamics. So, that's, uh, so then I think it's, there's some fundamental will we'll start change. Thank you. That, that's a great answer. Um, we're going down to three minutes. I'm so many questions. One of the things that a couple people in the audience want to talk about is nuclear. So I'm going to go to you, Abhijit, because of the, I, I did not know this, but one of our audience members knows that India has one of the largest abundance of thorium in the world. So now we've all learned something uh, from one of you. Uh, given that, and also just given the large, you know, we haven't said the words climate change, but the overlay of this entire conversation and conference is we need to get, and we'll hear from Chris Field on this too, we need to get to a place where we are lower carbon, we are using less carbon, we are sequestering more carbon. Nuclear is a carbon-free alternative. What is your thinking on nuclear's role in all of this? So to, to, I think about it two ways, right? Obviously, I work for SoftBank. Um, and SoftBank being a Japanese corporation, you know, you, some of you guys might know about our CEO, Masayoshi Son, how he was impacted by the nuclear uh, accident uh, in Japan uh, many years ago. Um, you know, so nuclear is a, uh, a no-no in our company. And, uh, you know, from, I'm sure there are several people in the audience who think of it, you know, a little differently. And I think that's a, that's a good view as well. Um, when it relates to India, I think, you know, two, two problems crop up. Number one is uh, the, uh, you know, cycle time of building a power plant, even though it might be big, uh, could be 10, 15, and in India it could be even longer because you know the earlier process, the bureauc bureaucratic process of land acquisition, environmental permitting itself can take take quite quite some time. Um, so you know, compare that with other things such as, for example, solar, which is what we do in large scale. Uh, one amazing thing about all these large plants that we build is we built a 580 megawatt plant in four and a half months. So, and, and the cost is very, very competitive. In fact, it beats most of the other sources. So right now, I think, you know, people realize that you know, abundant of wasteland, uh, abundance of wasteland, you know, 300 plus clear sunny days, et cetera, et cetera, which, which way would you go? So yes, I think thorium is definitely a, a uh, you know, st strength from a natural resource perspective for India. I don't think there will be zero nuclear, but I think nuclear would probably be under a percent uh, when it's all flushed out. Do you want to add on and, that? And uh, no, I think nuclear is great technology, but the thing about the nature of energy is about great technology, is about green and cheap energy for everyone. So, so that's solar and the wind, this and the batteries. So that one fundamental nature is they kind of modular approach, simple and modular. So it's not like a nuclear or gas power plant, it's very sophisticated. So it's great on technology, but 
it's difficult to duplicate and repetition. So that's why people can make solar panel so cheap, can make battery so cheap, because, and also make everyone to own the solar panel and the battery. So nuclear, you can own a nuclear station, but everyone now can own a solar station and own an EV or own one battery. So that's why the cost of energy for renewables is going down dramatically. But look at the nuclear, actually the cost is going up for the last 10 years. Well, and this is, um, and we, we are at time, but I will say this last answer really underscored something we've been talking about throughout, which is first, the, that companies are profoundly local. Com where companies are headquartered actually really matters. Your stance on nuclear is very specific, mm -hmm. and it influences where you do investment and what you do. And it, similarly, countries have their own very specific approaches to these technologies. So I think that's useful to just remember. We have a global trend, set of global trends, but all of them play out differently in different places um, for cultural and political and economic reasons. And then your final point, I think, is a really good one, just on the distributed nature, not just of the mark, the, the business model, but the distributed nature of, of the technology. Uh, join me in thanking our great panelists, Leigh and Abhijit, on a good conversation. Yeah.